a CNCF webinar, Application Snapshots Using Consistency Groups. I'm George Castro, Community Manager of VMware and a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our guest presenter today, Ravi Aluboyina, Senior Architect at Robin.io. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom UI. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the webinar. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that will be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I'll hand it over to Ravi to kick off today's presentation. Hi, uh, this is Ravi Kumar Aluboyna. I work for Robin.io. I'm the senior architect uh, at Robin. Robin is an application orchestration platform built on top of Kubernetes to run data heavy applications uh, which fall into SQL, NoSQL, and big data segments. Uh, Robin is the platform to run Oracle Rack, Postgres, MySQL, or MongoDB, Cassandra, Cloud or Kafka. Any data heavy application can be run on Robin platform. With that brief introduction of Robin, let's get into our agenda. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes landscape and especially the, the application landscape right now on 1.16. What kind of applications are suitable for running on Kubernetes? And then we'll jump into a little bit detailed discussion on databases and their IO patterns. And what is the challenge in running databases and snapshotting databases or any data heavy application on Kubernetes. And past that, we'll talk about the core constructs that will enable us to run these applications on Kubernetes, which is the consistency groups. And we'll have a brief Q&A session after that. With that, let's talk about Kubernetes and the application landscape. Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for running stateless applications. It's pushed aside every other orchestrator out there. If you want to run an Nginx form, the default option is Kubernetes today. And all of these applications, be it Node.js or Java or Nginx, WordPress, all of these applications roughly qualified as web applications. Now the second segment of applications are the databases, which could be Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, or MariaDB databases. These are traditional SQL databases. The following segment is distributed application stores, which could be document stores like MongoDB or key value pair stores like Cassandra or Influx, Prometheus, Redis. All of these are distributed in nature. These are modern day distributed uh, data stores. And to the far right is our heavy hitters. These are our big data applications, which could be Hadoop stacks or Elasticsearch or Splunk or big uh, OLAP application stacks, analytical processing stacks. That's our big data stack. So this is a classification from the application side. But if you're building a platform, if you're a Kubernetes orchestrator, there is a different division. So we call them stateless applications. We call all of these stateful applications. What we are going to dive into is deploying and orchestrating stateful applications, especially taking snapshots. So with that classification, let's get a little bit deeper into databases, which is SQL database and NoSQL databases. And let's inspect what is it that makes deploying and managing databases very challenging in Kubernetes landscape. Let's go briefly over these two segments of uh, SQL databases and NoSQL databases. Some of the attributes of SQL databases are primarily ACID compliance. Uh, and these are monolithic architectures, uh, primarily because these are built like decades ago, where bare metal is the predominant platform where this, these applications were deployed. And these are row-oriented databases. 
their primary workload is transactional workload and they have a standardized CPU interface. It's a very, very well-known data store. Whereas the NoSQL databases have made some compromises to address certain workloads. There is a tunable consistency. There is tunable durability guarantees. These are scale-out architectures uh, to, leverage, to leverage commodity hardware. And like I said, they target different workloads. Some of them target key values, key value pairs, some of them are document data stores. And they serve both OL, OLAP and OLTP. They serve both transactional load as well as analytical load. And they have non-standard client interfaces. Some of them do give out SQL semantics, but they have non-standard client interfaces like SQL or MongoDB client or Redis client. So this is a very, very high level overview on the distinction between SQL and NoSQL databases. So this is important in understanding or designing the primitives that will enable us to run these applications on Kubernetes. Let's talk about the standard database deployment models. So this is our Postgres application. Assume that it is running in a container. We are talking about Kubernetes here. So what is required for running Postgres on Kubernetes? Obviously, you'll need a data volume, which is provisioned through a CSI and that is coming from a storage stack. Let's call it data volume. The question now is, is this enough? In a test environment, maybe yes, but in a production environment, no. Because the recommendation of Postgres, or for that matter, any database, is that you put the val, write ahead log, or redo logs, or undo logs, in a different disk. So naturally, we'll go and ask Kubernetes CSI to provision another volume. So this forms our Postgres application, a container and two volumes. Now when we talk about applications like Cassandra, which are distributed in nature, which fall into the other segment of NoSQL databases, it follows the same pattern. It's not enough to just provision a data volume. So we have a commit log here, which mandates a different spindle or a different volume. So these are the recommendations for performance. So if you want better performance, you, you follow these recommendations of having two volumes. And on top of that, Cassandra is a little complicated because it's a distributed architecture. So we have more than one pods running and each pod consuming more than one volume of different IO patterns. Of course, this is a consistent hashing scheme for Cassandra. So what we have established here is on a standard SQL database, it's not just a container and storage. There is more to it. So you really have to understand what the application is doing and allocate storage accordingly. There is a data volume and there's a while right ahead long. When it comes to Cassandra, it's even more complicated because there are multiple containers in play and multiple volumes in play. So with this understanding, Let's see the actual transaction flow. What happens when a user issues a SQL statement? Assume that this is the data volume, so which is where the actual final data resides, which is one volume. And this is the wall. This is the right ahead log volume. These are two separate volumes coming from two different, let's say, disks. Now let's say user were to issue a SQL statement. A SQL statement could be auto commit or it could be a series of statements with a start transaction and a commit and a rollback at the end. Transactions start a bunch of statements and a commit makes one set. Let's say there's a start transaction. Usually what happens in majority of the databases is there is a start transaction entry written in the wall file. Let's say there were some data changes, which is an insert query or an update query. A block gets added. Whatever data, whatever change set is applied through the SQL statement is written into the transaction log. Let's say, for example, there is an update on 
a key x, we are changing the value to 20. So that x equal to 20 is written in the bar. Not exactly in that format, but roughly. The idea is to capture the changes in the transaction. And we make more, more changes to the, to the database, and then we do a commit here. So commit will be written as a marker entry in the wall. So what we have now is a start transaction, a set of changes, and a commit record. At some point, database processes will come in and do some sort of compaction. Different terms are, are used in different database uh, architectures. Essentially, what it means is we take all the changes and apply to the actual data blocks, which means we are writing the IOs. We're taking the IOs from one volume, compacting them, and writing to a different volume. That's, that is where the value x equals 20 is applied to a data block. So this is the standard flow in a, in a SQL database. In a NoSQL database, it's slightly more challenging because uh, there's a star for the transaction because they, some of the NoSQL databases or distributed databases do not offer transactional semantics. Uh, they offer pseudo transactional semantics. Same thing applies, there's a transaction the primary records it in its commit log and the commit logs are transferred uh, to the secondary sources or the replicas. The replicas are registered to these changes and then there's a commit, there's a flush that happens. Almost a similar behavior. So we, we have seen that the changes are applied to the transaction log first and then periodically they get flushed to the data blocks. And why is that? Fundamentally, there were some design assumptions made either for performance or durability or consistency. And what are those design assumptions? On the infrastructure side, the design assumption is that the transaction log and the data files will go to separate disks. And why is that? Because there are two writes involved and we don't want to have the two writes going to the same spindle. That will create an IO blender effect which is you spin the disk uh, in multiple ways. Right? We don't want to spin the disk uh, back and forth. We just want to keep appending. So that is wall. It is also possible that there could be multiple transaction logs. So we want all of these transaction logs to reside on different disks. And wall is an append-only workload to leverage the sequential access of a spindle. And crash consistency is assumed and designed into databases. At any point in time, if you abruptly shut down the server on which a database is running, it will come back up online. So that is assumed in the design. And that is, a, that is one of the reasons why we have redo and undo logs in databases. And NoSQL databases, which are distributed databases, assume that the partitions, which are those independent individual containers, they go on different physical hardware. So these are some of the design assumptions on the infrastructure side of it. So when a database designer will assume that oh, I will have this set from the infrastructure, and then I'll do some IO optimizations, which is val, write ahead log, which is an append only workflow. We call it undo log or redo log in different uh, database schemes. It's an append-only workflow. It's a persistent circular buffer. It could be one or more buffers uh, residing on the disk. There is dirty page management. This is like in-core structures versus on-disk structures. It's auto-vacuuming. There are different terms used in different database uh, uh, technologies. It is double write optimizations in MySQL database. And there are parallel X log, X log writes, which are transaction log writes. So what are we coming at? So we talked about the assumptions made on the infrastructure side. We talked about some IO path optimizations on the SQL side. This is, we are barely scratching the surface here uh, with the IO path optimizations. I'm talking in terms of, my goal is to, is to make you understand what is the infrastructure requirement just for this X log. 
So what we are looking for is in order to design a data protection strategy for an app, for a data heavy application like databases, we really have to understand how these databases are built. What are the design assumptions made by these applications? And what are the recommendations made by these application vendors? Now that we know a little bit about these assumptions where your val and data volume have to reside on different disks, if it is a distributed database, they have to go to the, the containers have to be provisioned on different hardware. Let's design a data protection strategy for this application. Let's talk about our standard Postgres database, which could be MySQL or Oracle, Oracle. Or Oracle Rack. If you were to use standard volume snapshotting, by that I mean we could using we could be using SAN LUNS for this data or data volume or the transaction log, or we could be using plain uh, LDM based volumes for data and transaction log. In either case, it is a volume that is provided to a database. And all of these volume management options, be it SAN or LVM, they have some sort of snapshotting capabilities. Let's say if we were to use those built-in snapshotting capabilities and snapshot these volumes, the data volume and value. So first hour we take a snapshot, which is we create a snapshot of these two volumes. Second hour we create and third hour we create a snapshot. What is wrong with this approach? Or more than what is wrong, how are we taking these snapshots? The loop. One of the simplest strategies to take the snapshot when multiple volumes are involved is to write a plain loop. That's right, that loop. Nothing but three lines code. For each volume, take a snapshot of the volume. What's wrong with this? Nothing so far, right? But when it comes to NoSQL databases, it's again the same loop, loop or loop for each container, snapshot each volume in that container. If it is as simple as this, uh, the world would be at peace, right? So there won't be any problem, but unfortunately it's not as simple as this. It is actually much, much more complicated than this. And what is the problem? This is the problem. The looping is the problem. And we'll see why the looping is a problem here. So we have these two database volumes, which are our data volume and a transaction log. Let's see what the loop is doing to these volumes. So this is our loop. Let's run through this loop. Time t0. I'm assuming that, not assuming, but there is an orchestrator that is running this loop. There is some process which is executing this loop. And at t0, that process initiated a snapshot of the transaction log. So we got our snapshot of the transaction log. It is a process. So it is bound to scheduling delays. Let's say our process got swapped out. The process that is running this loop got swapped out. So after some time, the process is rescheduled and it will trigger the snapshot of the data volume. So we got a second snapshot of the snapshot of the data volume. Depending on how the loop is implemented, it could be other way as well. We take the snapshot of the data and the process gets scheduled down and we go and take the snapshot of the uh, right ahead log. Anything is possible. I'm just giving you an example of a standard database, but imagine a Cassandra application with 50 partitions, which will translate to maybe 100 volumes. And if you follow the strategy of for each container, for each volume snapshot, you could be getting snapshots of these volumes at different points in time. 
question we should be asking now is it is inevitable that you get snapshots of these volumes at different points in time. You could argue that the delay is in milliseconds or microseconds, but it is inevitable that you get snapshots of these individual volumes at different points in time. The big question now is, are they consistent? Let's keep that question in mind. Let's go ahead and see what the problem is. So this is our timeline. Somebody runs a commit. It's the started a transaction, issued a bunch of updates, and there's a commit statement. So this is how, right after issuing the commit, this is how our write ahead log will look like, and this is how the data blocks will look like. X equals 20 is written to the transaction log, and a commit entry is written to the transaction log. There's nothing written so far to the data blocks because that is a periodic thread. It depends on a cadence or a trigger in the database logic that will come in, take the entries in the transaction log, compact them, and write to the data blocks. That hasn't happened yet in our time sequence. Now let's say we start the snapshot here at that point. How are we taking the snapshot? Our for loop is at work here. The loop comes in and tries to take a snapshot. Note that it's a loop. Let's assume that it picked up the data volume and took a snapshot. So that, that's a snapshot of our data volume. Now we have scheduling delays. But while our snapshotting loop is out, so we have database flush at work, which is the database process that is coming in and compacting the entries here. And that database flush did a transaction flush, which means it read all the entries from the transaction log and applied it to the data blocks. Now, if you see the picture here, the X equals to 20 is in the data volume. It's no longer present in the transaction log because the transaction log or the wall files are circular buffers, persistent circular buffers, which means the blocks are reused. So you just flush the entries from the transaction log. Now we, now our orchestrator comes in, the snapshot orchestrator, and it's trying to finish the snapshot, which means it will reschedule the loop. In the loop, the next volume is a transaction log, and we take a snapshot of the transaction log. So that this, the picture that you see on the far right is our final snapshot. What's wrong with this snapshot here? The snapshot here has no entries. Where is our x equals 20 in this snapshot? It's gone. So that is the problem with our snapshot. Let's say if you were to restore from this snapshot, so we get this picture. So you can clearly see the difference here. We ran a snapshot. The snapshot was triggered after we issued a commit. With the asset guarantees of the database, x equals 20 should be present in the database in the in the snapshot. But unfortunately, we don't have it. So there is a race between the for loop and the DB flush. There are two processes which are racing here. And that will cause uh, an invalid snapshot to be created. This is a big, big problem. And this is where our consistency groups come in. The core reason why this is happening is because we are treating these two volumes as two different entities and taking snapshots of, of these individual volumes. And this is a real problem in database snapshots. This is actually a data loss scenario. What are consistency groups? So consistency groups are groups of volumes that function as a unit for the application, which is our transaction log and database file. 
And this is a group on which the life cycle operations work. It is snapshot creating or extending volumes. And group that maintains the right order. So we write a transaction log and then the rights make to data volume. The right order is maintained here. And the group that preserves a crash consistency semantics because there is an assumption that the transaction log is written first and the rights are taken and written to data volumes. We maintain the crash consistency. At any point in time, if the database were to go down, we know for sure that the data is in the transaction log. It could be undone or redone based on whether the transaction is committed or not committed and whether we follow a redirect and write approach or copy and write approach. Let's design a better data production strategy. Now, now that we know about the consistency groups, let's design a better data production strategy. Let's combine these volumes and call it a consistency group. So we take a snapshot again on the first hour, we get a consistent snapshot of these two volumes. Same goes for the repeated snapshots that we take. So this will solve the problem of consist consistent snapshots. But is there anything more that we can do? So we can do more. Oh, before that more. What is the problem in the current case at K8 is or Kubernetes CSI stacks. It only operates at a single volume level. The volume consistency group concept is being worked on. For right now, there is only single volume level interfaces. I was talking about, is there anything that we can do more? Yes, there is something that we can do more. But before that, I want to explain uh, something else, which is, Database is not just a data file or a data volume and a transaction volume. It has configuration as well. It could be database configuration or it could be some metadata settings. Most of the database store it in the metadata tables, but there are some databases or some applications, I should say, like Cassandra would store in some configuration files. So there is not just data on well, but there is also configuration. But how do you capture that configuration part of it in a snapshot? The better approach is to actually snapshot everything, the volumes as well as the container, which will capture the volumes, the container. When we say container, we also capture the we also capture the topology of it. If the Cassandra has 50 partitions, we capture the fact that there are 50 partitions in this snapshot. And after the snapshot, if you were to scale out to 100 partitions and move back to 50, to that snapshot, you'll get 50 partitions back. So we capture the configuration, topology, and the data. So that's a much, much better approach to snapshotting than just snapshotting volumes. So the concept is we want to protect the entire application, not just the volumes. So Robin provides primitives on top of applications at an application level. So you can take a snapshot of the entire application and we protect data, configure metadata. So you can roll back to any snapshot at any point in time. We can push that snapshot, which is a consistent point in time image to a remote target by using the backup command. And we can restore from that backup at any point in time. And note that this is the app. So how do we do this? So I'll go over a brief architecture overview of Robin. So we have built on top of Kubernetes. We have not changed any Kubernetes. We have taken a CNCF certified Kubernetes uh, deployment. We built a distributed storage stack with all the enterprise grade features like snapshots, clones, QS, reputation, backup. We also have a pluggable net networking stack. 
what we realized is for applications like oracle we need the container identity persistence which means the ip address have to be hidden so we have storage we have compute in terms of kubernetes and we have networking and we built a workflow manager which will orchestrate the snapshots clones which is responsible for the consistency groups backups etc with this package we can manage the end to end life cycle of these applications robin is a software only platform that can be deployed in any cloud aws azure or google cloud platform or it can be deployed on a bunch of vms it could be esx or it could be openstack vms or on bare market and like i said we can consume we can run on any cloud any vm uh, we can run as a storage only provider on top of any star kes which is kubernetes engines running in cloud and with that you can run any of the distributed applications and we allow for the life cycle management of these applications so we have customer deployments of robin software allowing customers to run huge uh, data heavy application clusters um, we have a deployment where there are 11 billion security events getting ingested into elastic search uh, log stash and kibana alt stack uh, primarily there is a big multi hadoop deployment running on single robin cluster uh, with cl uh, two cloud era data lakes and two cloud era compute only clusters with kafka and ruby and there is a big deployment of 400 oracle rack databases running on robin cluster today and if you are interested in the product demos uh, please go to robin.io and check out how we do snapshots and rollbacks and how can we create clones of these applications out of snapshots or can we back up to cloud and instantiate an application in cloud and you can get a free trial from getrobin.io and please also subscribe to our slack channel slack.robin.io and that is robin supercharged kubernetes to deliver big data and databases and services Awesome. Thanks, Ravi, for the great presentation. We now have some time for questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask, uh, just drop it in the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we have time for. We have one question so far from Peter, who asks, "Hello, is Robin ready for Oracle cloud infrastructure?" So we are working towards it, but as of today, it's not. It's not certified yet. Okay, and that was a yeah. single question we have so far. I'd like to leave it open here for a minute or so if people have follow-up questions. So while the questions are coming in, I'd like to show a quick demo of sure. uh, of Robin. Like I said, Robin is a software platform. Uh, we so you get you can install it on a bunch of VMs or uh, hardware. Once you install, you get a dashboard like this, like App Store experience, where you will have all these data-heavy applications. You have Cassandra, Cloudera, Couchbase, Kafka, Hortonworks here. There's Oracle Rack, EBSV. So all of these majority of these applications, 25 to 30 applications, are out of the box available as bundles that you can use, which means they show up on your dash dashboard. You can click and deploy them. And I have some applications deployed here. So I have Oracle Rack. I have EBS, Cassandra, MySQL, and MongoDB. Let's go to Oracle Rack. So Oracle Rack is an Active Active Systems, which means there are two containers at play here. And if you can see this, there are lots of volumes here. The same thing that I was trying to explain that there are multiple data volumes. There are multiple redo volumes. There is Flash. There is Grid. And there is Redis volumes. all of this is a small deployment in terms of size but i want to show you the the scale in terms of number of volumes that needs to be managed so if you have an application like this and if you want to take a snapshot imagine the pain in using 
sand snapshots or LBMB snapshots. With Robin, the entire application can be deployed as well as managed. By that I mean, you can just say snapshot. And you can create a one-time snapshot. And if you have noticed, there is an option to create an application consistent snapshot. What databases give out of the box is a crash consistent snapshot. We can also allow you to plug in hooks where you can freeze the application if you choose to, and then take a snapshot. So now we have an entire application snapshot available for us. So this is a snapshot. Once you have a snapshot, we can create a clone or we can restore to a point in time. The entire application will be rolled back to that point in time. And there is an option to configure scheduled snapshots. You can run hourly snapshots or daily snapshots with retention periods. The same flow works for a MongoDB or Cassandra. It's exactly the same flow. Here I have a MongoDB application, which is a MongoDB distributed application. So you have a lot more containers in play. And, and there are a lot more volumes in play here. And if you want to snapshot this MongoDB cluster, I can just say snapshot. So that is the power that Robin brings to the table. So you can not only create applications in a fault tolerant manner, but you can also create application consistent snapshots. George. Uh, yep, I'm here. I'm good. Um, so if I, I can, if you have some more time, then I can show a little more details here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We don't have any questions. So unless anyone has any more questions, we could just keep, keep mm -hmm. showing okay. what you've got. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about the snapshots, uh, but let me also show you other interesting facts in Robin, which is you get a dashboard. And let's say if you want to deploy Cloudera here. So you can choose what you what role you want to deploy. Let's say I want Kudu here. Kudu is their uh, Cloudera's OLTP platform, the transactional platform built on top of Kudu. Uh, not built on top of Kudu, but it's, it's a different engine. So what I want to show here is you can set the sizing for your compute, which means cores and memory. You can also define the storage. You can say, I want replicated copies spread across racks. And I can set the block size. I can set compression. And I can set packer. This is the layout of the, the data on the disk. I can set encryption. You can also define workload type. This is these settings are more useful when you're defining something like a data node. Uh, I'd say I need three data nodes in a, in a Hadoop cluster. And this is my compute capacity. And here I'll probably say the Hadoop uh, throughput intensive volumes. Yeah, local is throughput intensive. And I know that Hadoop does three-way replication. And uh, this is a very small deployment. So let's say I have three instances here. Here is where an interesting thing comes in. Where prevent placing more than one data node container on the same node. So what this will do is it will place the three containers on three different physical servers. And we can also enforce storage and compute for the data node to be coming from the same node. These two policies are a must have for any distributed application that is doing its own replication. And there are many of them. This Hadoop, this Cassandra, this MongoDB, this CouchDB, Influx. There are many applications that do replication. So this is a 
granular placement policies that Robin offers. So with that, uh, if there are any more questions, then I, we can take up the questions. We do not have any more questions. That's great. Uh, last chance for questions, everybody. All right, great. Thanks, Ravi, for the presentation. Um, thanks for joining us today, everyone. This webinar recording and slides will be available online later on today. And we look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.